Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's educational webinar on ransomware. What is it and how can I defend against it? My name is Jeff Clark, and I serve here on the team at ArcLight and pleased to be the moderator for today's education. I see that we have more dialing in and joining us. Welcome. Our ransomware defense strategies education today is sponsored by the ArcLight Group. Uh, we're an information technology and business consulting group based here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jeff Clark. I get to serve as your program monitor, moderator for today. Okay, ransomware is considered the fastest growing malware hazard of the 21st century and continues to threaten our organizations. And today, we're going to learn some key ransomware defense strategies that can be deployed to protect your organization for this. It's also my privilege to introduce to you today's speaker. Uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about uh, Brian Largent, our speaker for today. He's the CEO and lead engineer for the Arclight Group, a company that he founded more than 13 years ago. Brian has more than 18 years of progressive corporate IT experience and has worked basically at nearly every IT technical job there is, including IT manager, infrastructure architect, system engineer, as well as help desk support. Uh, his diverse business and IT experience spans many diverse environments, such as medical, energy, manufacturing, import, export, and several 501c3 nonprofit organizations. A cornerstone for the ArcLight Group is providing helpful education. And our speaker today certainly has a heart and a passion for offering quality IT education. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Brian Largent. All right, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, you should see my desktop uh, where I've got the ransomware slides up. If you don't, please chat us and let us know. Today's topic, ransomware, what is it? How do you defend against it? How do you recover from it? Well, you know, you've heard about it in the news, you hear about ransomware, and basically you kind of get in the name that it's holding something ransom. Usually it's your data, your servers, your network, you know, various information and infrastructure so that you can't do anything with your systems until you pay the ransom. So how do you defend against it? Well, there's a lot of ways to defend against it. And there's a lot of things we're gonna talk about today to cover some of those things. But the most important question on this list, and this is the one that's often overlooked, is how do you recover from it? Ransomware is very hard to defend against. And so if you can't defend against it, at least have a recovery option. So one of the questions we had recently, I did a presentation in front of the Oklahoma Medical Group Managers Association, and I was asked by a CEO or CFO of a rural hospital what my uh, thoughts were on the solutions he needed to secure his environment. So I kind of started listing all the solutions. And he said to me, he said, you know, I've got to mitigate risk but I've also got to be very cost conscious. We're a rural hospital, we have a lot of expenses, and I can't buy every single thing out there to defend against ransomware. So we talked about it, and we kind of tried to come up with a mutual understanding of what is the minimum available and required security risk uh, mitigations that he needed to put in place. And we're still working through that with the, the CFO. But risk is something that people often overlook or don't really take into account, because unless you're an IT professional, you don't know what your risk is. And if you're not an IT professional and you're not being advised by someone who really understands what risk is, as well as understands that the financial burden of meeting and exceeding <laughs> all the expectations of protecting your network, it's really hard to get there. One of the things that we're seeing right now, and many of you have probably seen this as well, is that a lot of insurance brokers, you know, these are people who are, uh, oh, here we go. I think I'm about to get my video. There we go. So now you can see me. Hopefully you see me. So insurance brokers have uh, started to require a lot of um, you know, system security, a lot of uh, software agents and things to protect your network. So I was gonna touch on a few of those. Uh, the first thing I was gonna talk about was uh, a company named Sophos. They came out with a list in 2020 of what the average cost for a ransomware incident was. And this was a payout by insurance brokers. And that was $761,000 in 2020. As of 2021, it's been $2 million. So it's more than a double increase in the payout in ransomware. And the damage that's done from ransomware is business interruption, legal expenses, fines, brand damage. You know, if your, your brand, your facility, who you are gets damaged that you did not protect medical records, then people may choose not to go to your facilities. <clears throat> so 
Insurance brokers are actually uh, now starting to stipulate what you have to have to secure your environment. So I have a short list here of some of the stipulations to get ransomware insurance from one specific broker. They wanted you to have, uh, these are questions, so I'm gonna read these that way. So do you pre-screen emails for potentially malicious attachments and links? Do you provide a quarantine service to your users? Do you have the capability to automatically detonate and evaluate attachments in a sandbox to determine if malicious if malicious prior to delivery to the end user. Now that was probably all Greek on that last sentence. What they're asking is, do you use an enterprise grade, AI driven email spam filtering solution? That may have been a little bit of Greek too, but basically think spam filtering that protects you against malicious payloads in your email. So the cost to do that right now is around $5 per user per month. Another question is how often is phishing training conducted to all staff? In other words, uh, are you going out and sending phishing emails to your staff to test that they're actually applying the phishing training and testing training that you're putting them through? Are you sending them the training periodically? And the cost for that's about $5 per user per month. Can your users access email through a web app on a non-corporate device? If yes, do you enforce multi-factor authentication? So multi-factor authentication, again, the cost is about $5 a month. And I'm using very round numbers based on some assumptions here. Do you use an endpoint protection product across your enterprise? Do you use an endpoint detection and response product across your enterprise? The cost for an endpoint detection response software is about $11 per month. So what I'm gonna tell you right now is the minimum cost just in these meeting these requirements is gonna be about $26 per employee per month. And that's not even scratching the surface based on what your insurance brokers want you to do. So there was a good write-up and I promise I'm not gonna just sit here and read paragraphs to you the whole webinar. But I was going to read you this good write up about uh, insurance brokers that are dropping coverage. So ransomware claims uh, increased by 300 percent over 2020. And so insurance providers are tapping out and they dropping ransomware and cyber liability policies entirely. AXA decided to stop reimbursing French companies for ransomware payments to cyber criminals and the U.S. cyber insurance providers increased premiums by 22 percent in 2020. I know our insurance premium doubled because we serve healthcare. And of course, that has to be passed on to clients, regrettably. So an AXA, rep, uh, an AXA rep said, on one side, this decision will likely hinder flourishing ransomware businesses and indirectly incentivize would-be victims to implement better cybersecurity and enhance their cyber resilience. On the other side, the categorical ban will unfairly discriminate against enterprises who adequately care about their cyber defenses, but nonetheless fall victims to sophisticated attacks or because of their careless suppliers. So a careless supplier, even though you're secure, if you have a careless supplier like your electronic medical records company and they get compromised, it can still hurt you, even though you have good measures in place. So, so this is a really important quote. Insurance is designed to mitigate losses from various cyber incidents, including data breaches, business interruption and network damage. It is not a compensating control in place of a good cybersecurity strategies. Companies need to put security front and center and limit or mitigate the risk. So when we talk about any kind of ransomware, it's all about risk mitigation. All right. So one of the things we're trying to do, and this is an old uh, little advertisement we did years ago uh, for explaining the difference between having some security and having no security or very limited security. And so on here, we sent this out and, you know, everyone wants to get a Band-Aid in the mail. It probably wasn't a great advertisement for us. But so this is what we said is this is a sucking chest wound Band-Aid. And here's a little scratch. Which one do you want? Now, the truth is there's differences between these two. So you might you might have some good defenses in and you might still get attacked. You might have some great defenses in and still get ransomware. But you want to mitigate that. and You want to have recoverability. And that's why we say let me move some screens around here. And that's why we say, uh, how do you recover from it? That's important. All right. So let's first explain what is ransomware. Ransomware is an encryption. All it is, is it's an encryption where you don't control the key. So what is encryption? This is a basic number substitution cipher. So for every num letter, you have a number. And so what ransomware would do is it takes your data on your computers. Think of it as, you know, just think of it as alphanumeric, you know, so they go and swap whatever the uh, letter or number or whatever for the data on your computer with something that is not the same. And they have a secret decoder ring. And that decoder ring allows them to decrypt that information if they so wish. And they're only going to do that if you pay the ransom. All right. So that's how encryption works. So in an application, the word encryption, that these numbers would mean what that, you know, if I take and I use my secret decoder ring, 514, 318, so on, 
I can decrypt that into the word encryption. So what are the attacker motives? Well, they want to resell your EPHI. They want to uh, contact, uh, resell your PCI compliant information, your financial information, your personally identifiable information, other data to malicious buyer. You know, they want to get the ransom, but there's a lot more that they want. And people really always talk about the payment. That's not all that there is. Once someone gets in your network, they want to do a lot more. Like they want to launch, uh, use the data to launch additional attacks. So if they get into your systems, an attacker gets in, they don't just get in there and launch ransomware the day that they get in. What they do is they start gathering information. They infiltrate the system and they exfiltrate data. So they might get in, get all of your email addresses and everything in your system. Then they might masquerade as you to get other people infected before they've even launched ransomware on your environment. The average dwell time, dwell time meaning the amount of time that people are in networks right now, uh, attackers are in networks before they launch ransomware is about 45 days. That's a lot of time to be able to get in and do a lot of damage and do a lot of research, get a lot of data out, and then use that for weeks, months, or even years after the ransomware incident is over. So they want to get ransomware payments. They want to co coerce payment via threat to release data. You know, they've got, they go in, they take your data out, and they say, well, even if you don't pay us for, for the ransomware key, we're going to release your data if you don't pay us. And then they got corporate or national defense espionage. If you guys are familiar with the Stuxnet virus, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you can read all about it. Stuxnet virus was supposedly, I don't think anyone's admitted it yet, but it's its pretty, pretty uh, accepted that the Israelis and the United States came together to create a virus that would specifically target the centrifuges, centrifuges uh, being used on a Siemens uh, system used in Iran for enriching uranium. So, so you know, corporate espionage is not something that is uh, new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, using it in a cyber environment is not old. There's not new either. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, every nation does it to some form or fashion to uh, move their own incentives forward or move their own uh, needs forward. So damage a foreign nation. So I talked about Stuxnet, but there's also just a straight up damage people. So if the United States or Russia wants to hurt one of our, our enemies, we go in and we just attack them through uh, cyber means to try to harm their infrastructure or what have you. You've probably heard on the news where they, they have a lot of concern about the uh, aging hardware and equipment being used for water treatment plants and facilities like that. There's been uh, attacks that have been identified against that in the United States from foreign actors. Uh, so it's it's a very real thing. We're not talking about kids in their basement anymore that are just trying to you know see what they can get away with. This is very orchestrated from organized crime to state uh, sponsored actors and malicious destruction of data, malicious employee, vendor, or contractor. And this is also often overlooked. You get an employee, they're disgruntled, they leave your organization, um, but their accounts were not disabled, and they go in and log into their email account, and they send out emails to all of your suppliers and all of your customers telling them how bad of a company you are and, and just really damage your reputation. So good reason to have good policies for hiring, termination, and for transfers when you move an employee from one part of your organization to another. Oops. So one of the examples I use whenever I do an in-person presentation about ransomware is I have this little lockbox that has a, a, it'll take biometric, but mainly it's for the code on there. And so I'll take someone's phone, I'll put it in the box and I'll say, there, I've ransomware your phone. Here, you can have it back. They've got their phone, but it's in a box. It's just like you. If you get ransomware, you have your data, but it's encrypted. You don't really have it. It's sitting on your servers, it's sitting on your network, but you cannot access it, read it, or do anything with it. So what you have to do is you have to give me some money and then I'll unlock the box with the code and let you get your phone back out. So it's just a great example of, of how ransomware works. So there's legitimate uses of encryption, which everyone should be using. If you're in healthcare, uh, there's this thing called the HIPAA safe harbor. And that is if you encrypt your data. So a good example of that is if you have a laptop and you encrypt the data using an encryption solution called Microsoft BitLocker. There's zero cost for the solution. It comes in Windows 10 Pro or higher. And if you enable that, then if your laptop gets stolen out of your car, someone does a smash and grab, they knock out your window, they pull your laptop out, and it's got every medical record in your entire system on that laptop, you do not have to report to the Office of Civil Rights. There's no requirement for you to report because it's encrypted, it's in an unrecoverable format. So every computer on every network that could or does contain electronic protective health information should be encrypted. And it should be encrypted using BitLocker or something similar. So not legitimate use of encryption is ransomware. 
And there's a lot of names. You'll hear them in the news. We hear them a lot more because we work in technology. But some of the big names are WannaCry, Petya, Not Petya, Locky. I mean, these, these real cheeky names for, for these attacks that cost billions of dollars. And they'll use hybrid AES-256 and RSA. And what they'll do is not only do they encrypt your data, but they encrypt the attack vector so you cannot get in and figure out the, the encryption key or do anything with it. So once it's encrypted, uh, then you either have to start over, restore from backup, or you just have to pay the encryption and uh, pay the ransom and hope that you get the key. And oftentimes you don't get the key. Oftentimes people pay the ransom, the attackers just take the money and disappear. So defense against the dark arts, know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. So I'm kind of kind of putting two things together here. You know, defense against the dark arts is a play on Harry Potter, but the know thyself, know thy enemy, that's Sun Tzu. So, so really the dark arts are the attackers, right? They want to get into your, your systems. They want to make money. They want to damage you in some form or fashion or all of the above. But you need to know your enemy and you need to know how to fight the battle. When we talk about this, what we're talking about is how hackers and attackers, I hate the word hackers, it's an overused term. Basically, these are just, just malicious people that want to do damage for some reason, right? So when these people want to do this, they want to uh, get into your systems and become embedded in your systems. You need to know what they're going to try to do to get into your systems, to know your risk, to know what mitigations you want in play to put in place to stop that. So we're going to go into that a little bit more as we keep going. So the first thing we have is the four evil pillars. These are the four evil pillars of an attacker. They want to infiltrate your system. They want to embed in your system. They want to exfiltrate, take data out of your system, and then they want to hold you ransom. So the most important thing in here is the embedding. A lot of companies think that just because they have um, backups that, well, if we get ransom, we're just going to restore from backup. Yeah, we might have some downtime, but we're going to be just fine. That is not true anymore. Earlier when I was talking about uh, the time, the dwell time that attackers get in your network, what they're doing is they are embedding themselves in your systems, okay? So when we talk about backups, there's two basic types of backups that have been around forever. There's file level backups and there's volume level backups. File level backups is we're just gonna back up the files on your servers and your computers, and then we're gonna restore those files. Well, the problem with file level backup is it can't restore all your applications the way they were. You still have to rebuild all your systems. There's a lot of cost, a lot of delay. So nobody does file level backup anymore. What everyone's doing now is they're doing volume level or full system. Think of it like a full system backup. We back up your operating system, all the applications as they're installed. So whenever you have to do a recovery, we restore everything exactly the way it was. We can put it on dissimilar hardware, wherever you want it to, to run in the cloud, on premise, doesn't matter. And all that stuff comes up the way it was. You don't have to re-implement your electronic medical record system. Everything just starts and works the way it was. Sounds great. Except that since the attackers get embedded in your systems, they also embed into your operating system under running memory in many places they possibly can, hundreds or even thousands of places embedded in your system. So now you can kind of see what I'm talking about. They've been in there for 45 days or more. I re go to recover from the previous day after the ransomware was kicked off. They kick off ransomware again because they're still in your system. So how do I root all of that out of your system? How do I get the attackers out of your backups to be able to do a safe restore? Well, it's not easy. And the reason it's not easy is because once the ransomware hits, I don't have logs that I can easily go through. Well, not even easily. I don't have logs at all that I can go through and figure out where did the attack come in? Where did they embed everything? And how did, how did they get totally into your system so I can start to back them out? And that's where we get into a solution called log aggregation. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more as we go. But log aggregation, just in short, is where we take all the logs from your Windows computers, your firewalls, your network devices, uh, everything on your network. And we every device creates logs because that's how we troubleshoot as IT professionals. But they're all islands. The logs on your workstation, the logs on your servers, the logs on your firewall, on your switches, they're all islanded devices. So you need a log aggregator that takes all those logs pipes them off out of your network so they can't be ransomware. And then when an attack happens, we can go and run, use AI to go and look through those logs to figure out where all the attack vectors came in, where all the embedded attacks happened, and then we can root all that out. It's a very, very important thing to have log aggregation. It's not a cheap thing to have. I didn't even talk about that when we were talking about pricing before. So log aggregation is the key to recovery. All right. So again, infiltrate, embed, exfiltrate, ransom. And it's some form of gain, either personal for a nation or whoever. So there's four good pillars. The four good pillars are people, process, policy, hardware, and software. People, 
is a very important and there's it's first on this list for a reason because you know if if you lock every door in your house oh, let me use this analogy you you have a castle and you've got a drawbridge and an enemy walks up to your drawbridge knocks on the drawbridge and the scullery maid goes out and opens the drawbridge and said yes can i help you well the enemy walks into your castle takes your whole castle destroys everything in it because the the scullery maid the person who had no responsibility in the castle to defend it whatsoever was able to just go open the drawbridge. So in your organization, your employees are the vector of attack more than anything. It's gonna be phishing emails that they receive and they just nonchalantly say yes, or it looks like an Office 365 password reset and they go put their password in. Those are the people that are gonna cause you the most grief and get you in the most trouble. So we put them as number one. The number one defense is your people. You need to train them. And when we talk about training, We've all done it. We've all done this, this training where you sit down for two hours once every three months or six months or a year and, and every employee kind of is on their phone and they're not really paying attention and you're talking to them about fishing and how it's important and they maybe take a little test and they sign off and then they go back to their job and they ignore it and act like nothing ever happened and they continue to click on every email that comes in and get themselves in trouble. So what you need to do is you need to send those employees phishing emails. You need to send them emails that are actually phishing. Not, not from a uh, not from a attacking uh, perspective, but from a safe perspective. So for us, what we do is we have a system where we can send phishing emails to our clients. And if the employee falls for a phishing email, it automatically notifies us. And when we get notified, then we can send them to remedial training. The employer can decide how they wanna handle that with the employee, gives you a lot of options. You can, instead of making it disciplinary, what we encourage people to do is to make it a positive thing. Whoever catches the most fish emails, and there's a thing called catch fish that allows you to catch emails. Whoever catches the most fish gets a Starbucks card every week, you know, or at the end of the month, you give them a bonus or something. So make it fun, not punitive, and people will take the training seriously. They'll look forward to finding all those phishing emails. Make it valuable for your organization. All right, so process. Process, like I was talking about earlier, when we talk about process, uh, the, the simplest process, and there's lots of them, but the simplest process that you need to have is hiring, transfers, and termination. When you hire someone, do they go through all the training that they need to? Um, when you transfer someone, do you move their permissions? There's a, there's a rule in HIPAA called minimum necessary. Minimum necessary means that every employee in your organization should have the minimum necessary access to electronic protected health information to be able to perform their job. So if you have a small medical practice and you have, let's say, 10 employees and every employee can see everything in your EMR, that is not keeping with the minimum necessary rule. The same thing goes for access and security on your systems. No employee should have full access to their computers to be able to install software and do things like that. You need to have processes for hiring, firing and transfers. Transfers is often overlooked. Someone moves from point A to point B in an organization from, say, a front desk office job to a back end office job. You need to have a transfer document that says, hey, now that they've changed, this is their responsibilities and roles they've changed, we need to go in and, and limit their access to the solutions in our e or their, the modules in our electronic medical record system that they don't need to have access to anymore. Same thing for termination, someone leaves an organization. Really common uh, attack vector that uh, gets often overlooked is a lot of organizations will have wireless access for their building and they'll use what's called a static SSID. Everyone knows how to get into the network from the for the corporate network on the wireless side. And then you have an employee leave and nobody changes that wireless access. An employee that's malicious could literally come into the organization, either park themselves in the waiting room or park themselves outside the building, join, connect to the network and launch attacks to the organization. So you really want to have those policies for changing passwords, changing systems and build your systems in a way that makes termination very easy and fluid, knowing that you're going to be able to access uh, that acts cut off that access for employees that leave the organization. All right, so in policies, same thing, you need to have all your policies and procedures uh, together, uh, policies of your HIPAA compliance handbook, uh, how you're going to do business, what are the ramifications for not being in compliance for employees, and then hardware and software. Okay, hardware and software, a lot of people think, you know, the number one thing I need is I need good security hardware, I need good security software. Again, people are first, process and policy are, are the next two, and then hardware and software comes in last. That's your agents, like your antivirus, your endpoint detection re response, that log aggregation system I was talking about is a security incident and event management system. That's gonna log aggregate so that you can recover if you get attacked. It also does some defensive measures. So those are important as well. 
but start with people, work your way down to, to everything else. People are your cheapest solution. They're the, they're the cheapest way to defend against attack. All right. So survivability and productivity are propped up by people, process, policy, hardware, and software. That is how you're going to be able to survive an attack or even prevent an attack from happening to begin with. So like I said, so people, you need training, testing, and accountability. Process, you need to have all your process for hiring, termination, transfers, et cetera. Policy, you need an employee handbook, risk assessments, recurring policy reviews, and that list goes on. I mean, this is just kind of the high points. So we talk about hardware and software, and I'm not gonna read every single one of these, but this is a, a short list, believe it or not, of all the solutions out there, uh, of some of the solutions out there to protect your environment. So endpoint detection and response. That is another type of log aggregator. So think about it as antivirus on steroids. Whereas an antivirus tries to block things before they can get into your computer or server, an endpoint detection and response will try to do the same thing. But then if it sees an infection, it will isolate that infection to that one computer, roll back the infection to a previous state, and you'll move on like nothing happened. It's a really slick solution. Now, it isn't always going to catch every type of ransomware, but its track record right now is very good at blocking and recovering from ransomware. One of the, the two, or one of the things that when a company gets hit, there's two software solutions that get rolled out to help that company recover immediately. And it's two software solutions that most companies should have, if they're of any size at all, should have. And that's an endpoint detection response. And then the next item is the security incident and event management system. Every company that's, you know, and I would say every company needs a SIM. So S-I-E-M, that's what it stands for, security incident and event management system. Every company needs a SIM, but they're very expensive. And that goes back to your risk calculation. It's risk and reward. It has a lot of cost to it. If you're doing some other things, it may be a risk you're willing to take because the cost is very high for a SIM. It's a very smart system, very expensive. But when companies get attacked, the first thing that the company that comes out to help them recover from that attack does, is they're going to roll out an EDR, endpoint detection response, and they're going to roll out a SIM. And that way they can travert, they can see all the data traversing the network, they can correlate the logs and start to clean up the mess. Once they leave, those systems are either taken with them and then the organization needs to go buy them themselves, or they leave them in place and we'll charge you a service fee to be able to keep those there. So multi-factor authentication is a pretty low hanging fruit that nobody likes. Um, you've seen your bank do it. You know, Years ago, the banks went to requiring MFA and it may be a text message. You wanna log into your account. So you put in your username and your password and then you get a text message and you get a code, you put it in, you get in. It's annoying, it slows you down, it reduces productivity. I get it. I, I don't like it any, any more than anyone else. And if I showed you my phone right now, I've got probably 50 different multi-factor authentications uh, that I have to use to get into our systems, into our client systems. We roll it out globally for everything we do. Because if we're not safe, our clients certainly aren't safe. So we have to we do a, a lot of security ourselves. And it slows things down. It's inconvenient. We don't like it. It works. Um, people have a very hard time. Attackers have a very hard time getting into your system. They can get your password, then get your username. It's, it's actually not too hard to do that since people reuse usernames and passwords whenever they register for public websites like LinkedIn. LinkedIn got compromised a few years ago. And when it did, all those username and passwords went out on the dark web. And so if your username is the same username as you use for your email address, so blargent at algsys.com, and I use that to register on LinkedIn, and then my password is the same one I use to log into my computer, as soon as that hits the dark web, someone knows how to get into my system. And it is not hard to take an email address, figure out who the company is because of the email domain at the end, the, the .com part. If I know what that is, I can track it back to the company in a matter of minutes, be launching attacks against your organization and possibly even just get into your systems immediately from remote using either a VPN client or remote desktop, Citrix, uh, any of the different remote access solutions that your hospital organization may have in place. It's not a hard thing to do. All right. Um, so you need to do multi-factor authentication because it is a third form of authentication that expires usually after 30 seconds to, to 60 seconds. And it, it only works if you have the device or the code that it generates to be able to do that. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. There's push to a smartphone, which a lot of companies don't like that because you push to a smartphone. Am I going to pay for my employee smartphones? There's also key fobs, um, which I've got one right here. Pull this out. So you got a key fob and so we use duo and so you push that and now you've got a six digit code so i can log in now these you can give to employees they're like 25 30 bucks to buy a key fob 
Uh, and that's a better way to do it if you have employees that complain about using their phones. However, push is the best way to do that. And then there's there's other ways. There's several other solutions out there, but multi-factor authentication is a great defense and everyone should be using it. If you're not using it, it's gonna get mandated. Um, that's one that is the insurance companies are not gonna allow people much longer to have secured to secure data without multi-factor authentication. One of the other things when we talk about insurance, these, these insurance things, I was telling you, read, reading some of the questions that they're asking now, they're eventually going to say that you didn't do your due diligence to protect your environment and you're not going to get a payout. Um, it, it's going to be it's going to be a pretty ugly mess when that starts to happen. What I want people to do is when those things come in, when you're filling out your your insurance forms and you're saying yes or no to these things, you might find out that, you know, my my risk profile is is making my hospital with 200 employees, my insurance is $15,000 a year. The cost to actually implement all the things that maybe ArcLight re recommends may be $100,000 a year. And you're saying 15 versus 100. That 15,000, it may not pay out. You're saying on these documents with your insurance brokers that you're not putting these things in place. And they're going in and they're trying to decide what is their risk. So just, it's, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act and you need to have an IT professional that can actually articulate that and work with you guys to figure out what is the right balance for you. All right, so the next thing, and then I'm, I'm gonna move on pretty quick. So the next thing is privileged access management. Privileged access management is, um, if you're familiar with your computer at work, if you can go and install any printer you want on your computer at work, or you can install any software you want, you don't have any access restrictions, that's becoming a big no-go. The insurance brokers are even saying that you have to have uh, it, they're asking, do you have full administrative rights to local resources is one of the ways they'll say it. If you do, that means that when an attack happens, when the employee clicks on the email that has ransomware and it launches, it's going to be able to run as a local administrator on that computer so it can install itself, it can embed itself in that system and then use that system to launch attacks against other computers. If you're not a local admin, then it can't as easily do that. It can still do some things, but it can't as easily launch attacks or install itself or embed itself. And so what you want to use is a privileged access management system because that will restrict the ability for the local, local user account to do things without authorization. And a privileged access, I'm going to call it PAM, it's privileged access management system, PAM for short. What a PAM does is allows organizations to then select what applications and what things can the user do and what things can they not do. You don't want to just take away everyone's administrative rights. If you do that, you're going to have very unhappy employees very quickly because you're going to have an employee that goes home, needs to use their laptop, needs to install their local printer at home to do some work, and they can't without calling IT. Then you have administrative overhead. Your IT team is being swamped with questions and asking to be able to give rights. And now you've got to go and ask HR, are they authorized to do this and this? With a PAM system, you can go in and say, yes, you can install printers because there's not a lot of of, of concern with printers. You can install updates for things like Zoom. Zoom releases updates probably once a month, twice a month even. Uh, and so without administrative rights, you cannot install Zoom updates that are coming out regularly. And if you need that as part of your job, it's gonna be very difficult to, to, get your, to do your job. So with a PAM, we can say Zoom can be installed. The user has a right to do that, but they can't install any unauthorized software. So a PAM is a great way to secure your environment. So uh, advanced threat protection, that's when we get into your email filtering. I'll touch these real quick. Subscription-based firewall router. The days are gone of being able to buy a basic firewall for a business. If your business uses like, if you're a small hospital of practice or whatever, and you're using a consumer grade firewall, those days are gone. Um, you need to have something that's smart that actually looks at every packet coming into your network analyzes that data and determines whether it's going to allow it in or out. And it needs to do things like content filtering, antivirus on the gateway, which means that you're doing an antivirus scan before it even touches your computers, rather than waiting for something to come into your network, touch your computers and hope the antivirus gets it. So those are layered protection. So your, your firewall should be doing that as well as your antivirus on your endpoints. Um, the reason it's subscription based is the same reason that you have to pay for a subscription for your antivirus. You're not going to get the latest definitions. They're constantly releasing information that's that updates that system so you can you can prevent the latest attacks. If you don't have it subscription based, you're not going to get any updates. Your firewall is just simply a door that's locked that anyone can open. So it's not a risk that you want to take. So a subscription based firewall is very important for securing your environment. And there's tons of them out there. 
Um, you know, we are Cisco Meraki shop. We're big fans of them, been using them for years. We haven't seen a virus in one of our client sites in five or six years now. Uh, so, so that's just one, but Sophos makes them. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. So you want a subscription-based firewall. You want system patch management. A lot of people assume that their computers are being patched automatically. Um, you know, you'll see the updates come on your computer that it's getting patched. We manage patching for our clients and you need to manage it either yourself in your IT department or you need to manage it with a third party. And the reason is patches fail. When patches fail, vulnerabilities are there and that's how you're gonna get infected. You need to manage patching on known software. There's a big vulnerability out, it's been out forever for Adobe Flash Player. Most people, we go out and scan their networks and we'll see Flash Player. In fact, I just did one the other day for a 900 employee company and there was over a hundred instances of Adobe Flash Player across their entire network. Adobe Flash Player, if you go to a website that has a, a payload to attack Adobe Flash, it will immediately pretty much <laughs> infiltrate your system and cause you a lot of grief. So you need to clean those things up. Content filtering, uh, content filtering, when people talk about content filtering, they usually think, oh, my employer doesn't want me to go to Facebook. And they, you know, I wanna go do those things and I'm not gonna get in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons we in IT, because Facebook has a lot of attack vectors, a lot of attacks that can come through it. But what we really care about is the accidental things that people do. So for instance, uh, years ago, and in a former life, I was working for a large oil company and I wanted to go to my Hotmail email account. And this is back in the 90s. And so I was in a hurry and I was doing something and I typed in Hotmail without thinking and I spelled it H-O-T-M-A-L-E. Well, you can kind of imagine where that went. So the next thing I know is all these things are popping up on my screen. I'm shutting my computer down. I'm trying to let people know, hey, I didn't mean to do that. That wasn't intentional. Uh, so so I, uh, it was kind of embarrassing, but, but it happens. People type in the wrong domain. Uh, we had a question at the uh, Eastern Oklahoma MGMA group uh, when we were speaking and a, a woman that was attending, she said that she went to a website that appeared to be legit. And when she went, it was popping up all kinds of stuff and said she, she'd had viruses on her computer and everything else. Well, what probably happened was that she typed one of the letters wrong. One of the things that attackers will do is they'll buy something like Hotmail, H-O-T-M-A-I-L.com, and they'll buy H-O-T-M-A-I ll.com or something like that. Somehow that people, you know, what is the common misspelling of words? They'll buy it, put a payload on it, and assume when you've got billions of people in the world that are logging into that solution that you'll get someone to hit your site. And it's it's just playing the game and they'll win at it and it'll work. And if that someone that hits that site has Adobe Flash Player and it's not been uninstalled because it's got known vulnerabilities, they're gonna get a payload on that system. Content filtering will stop that from happening. Intrusion prevention and, and detection system, a smart firewall, a subscription-based firewall will almost always have this feature. Uh, it's just looking for attacks. It's looking for uh, things trying to get into your network. It's kind of a, uh, they're not all AI driven, artificial intelligence driven, but a lot of them are, and they look for known attack vectors. They're correlating attacks from thousands or millions of different firewalls on the network, looking for what's going on and will automatically block things that it knows are a threat. Backup disaster recovery. Uh, this is what we talked about before. It's not enough to just have backups. You need to have backups. They need to be offsite. There's a term we use called air gap. Your backup should not be on the same network segment as what they're backing up. A uh, company in Tulsa uh, contacted us about, it's been about six months ago. They were looking at just outsourcing their help desk to ArcLight. We were excited, thought it'd be a great thing. They're about 200 employee company, and then they just went dark on us. We hadn't heard anything from them. We went a couple of weeks, sent them some emails, called, hadn't got a hold of anyone, and found out that, that company was hit with ransomware. From the time that they had talked to us, uh, it was about a week later, they got hit with ransomware, lost their entire environment. The curse for that company was they had backups on site, they had backups off site. The off site backups were connected to the same network segment. They had separate authentication, but the attackers were in the network, and this is according to the FBI and all the different people that were involved in it. The, the attackers were in the network for more than 90 days, they, they believe, and were able to go to their other network segment because it was on the same network. They went to the other network segment, were able to try logins and passwords <clears throat> that they had compromised, and were able to get into that and purge all of their backups at their remote site. They purged all the backups, kicked off ransomware, took down the whole network. They lost all their data. They're trying to, they were trying, well, they've recovered now or still in the recovery process. They had to rebuild their data from things like emails where they had sent an accounting uh, file to their accountant to go rebuild their accounting package. They have to re-implement all of their uh, ERP systems and things like that, that they're not cheap to do. Imagine if you had to re-implement your ERP, you're on Epic 
or you're on uh, uh, all scripts, you know, you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to have it done the first time. Now imagine trying to do it again with limited data, trying to get that data back in there. It's not going to be as cheap as it was the first time you did it. I can tell you that much. All right. Um, see mobile device management. Uh, so mobile device management, it's, it's a hit and miss thing. If you own phones uh, in your organization and you provide those cell phones and tablets to the, the employees, you should have MDM, mobile device management, on those devices to be able to secure them. You don't want your employees going and installing any of the ransomware, or not ransomware, any of the, uh, just any app on the Microsoft or <laughs> Apple store. You don't want them installing stuff on there because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Um, they've shown it time and time again, and, and what you really don't want is you don't want the employees taking their phone while they're at church and handing it to their kids and letting their kids install every free app under the sun that can track information. If you've ever installed an app on your phone, which we all have, it first thing it asks you is, will you grant access to your pictures and to your blah, blah, blah? Well, if you've taken, if you grant access to those apps and you take pictures of some x-rays, now you've given an app access to those x-rays. You're, you're a doctor, you're in a facility and you're trying to hurry and you take a picture because you need to go do something. Those apps get access to that information. You don't want that to show up on the dark web. And then third party risk assessments. Make sure you do a scan. If you're using a third party to do HIPAA compliance for your organization, it's not enough to check a bunch of boxes. Don't, don't, don't get a company that does that. If they're just checking boxes or asking you questions, getting you to give them answers, that is bad. I'm not saying you got to use ArcLight, but you need to use someone that uses a system that scans your network, physically scans it, uh, and it's going to use two technologies, WMI, that's Windows Management Instrumentation, and uh, SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. Those are going to actually go out and try to pull information, real information off of every computer in your network. What's your patch level? Is your antivirus installed? Is it up to date? And it's going to tell you if you have the policies in place on your system for things like screen lock timer, for um, uh, encryption, do you have encryption enabled on your network? Rather than assume and just check those boxes, no. And you can know, you just need to use someone that actually does a scan of your network to know if you're meeting those guidelines. All right, so I meant to get off that slide quickly and I'm sorry, I kind of got going. All right, so this is what we're trying to avoid, you know, the chalk outline. We don't want to see dead bodies. We don't want to see dead people uh, and dead companies and people unemployed. Um, this, is, this is the real battle that's out there. Um, so, so how do you recover? So we talked about recovery. Um, so you can deploy all the tools in the previous slide. You can pay the ransom, redeploy your environment from scratch, recover from backups. Not going to be likely possible unless you have verified, verified your backups or offsite, they're air gap. They don't use the same authentication mechanism. You can sell your organization or your hospital or your practice to a competitor or a larger provider, and you can close your doors forever. All of these we've seen happen for organizations that get ransomware. So, you know, the number one thing to defend against ransomware is to have your backups air gapped on another infrastructure at, at somewhere else with totally different authentication. If you have that, then the problem is, is how embedded in your backups is the ransomware. You're still looking at days, possibly weeks or months to get all that stuff out of your backups to be able to do a recovery, which is like not having backups at all. So you wanna be really cautious. There's a lot of things that we can do. Log aggregation is the number one way to defend and recover against ransomware attacks. And just, we really wanna avoid this. We don't wanna lose our jobs. We don't want our employees to be out of, out of work. We don't wanna have all this trouble and headache. Uh, and we certainly don't want to uh, betray our patients and others by having their information end up in the wrong hands and possibly be used against them. One of the things that I've, I've used an example over the years is uh, for a brief while, we tried to get into home health uh, as an organization because we work with healthcare providers and home health is a very large market. And there's a lot of them around here. So I went to a home health provider in a small town in Oklahoma, I won't name them. And uh, I showed up and, and the woman said that, you know, well, we've got this, this application we use, but every time I launch it, I get this other pop-up. And I went and looked at it and it was a virus. The whole computer was just riddled with virus. She was having to minimize them. She had like six bars on her browser that were all viral bars and malware and everything else. So, so these, you know, I, I explained to him, I said, this is, this is something you need to clean up. Here's what's going on. I said, well, we don't have the money to do that. And what broke my heart is this was a, a, I don't know if poverty be the right word, but this was a home health place in rural Oklahoma. And it, they didn't have a lot of money. The people that were there were probably on some form of government subsistence to pay for them to be there. And the thought that went through my mind is these poor people that are here, 
their records are now probably in the hands of an attacker who can then, uh, you know, take their identity, steal it, and try to get information and money. And do these people have family and others that are going to defend them? So it just it breaks your heart when you see it, and that you know there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> it's just uh, they don't have the money. They've got a facility. They're going to run it, and and you know that's the way they're going to do it. So. So you, you know, we all owe it to our patients, we owe it to our clients to help defend. There is a risk calculation. We all need to make good risk decisions. We need to be educated on what the threat is, how we can recover from it, and spend the right amount of money. There's a Gartner report that I, I reference every now and then. It said that about, it was done in like 2017, and I'll, I'll find that and we'll send it out, but uh, it said that about it was about $6,500 uh, per year per employee to provide all the security and um, uh, software licensing for an employee at a hospital or at a medical practice. And when I've talked to several companies, I found that they spend probably less than two or three hundred dollars a year on on that service to, to be able to secure their environment and so on. And you know, we're on we're on your side. You know, you're getting squeezed by the government. You're getting squeezed on your payments, uh, payouts. At some point, there's going to have to be a break because if you guys are getting squeezed and you can't afford to do the security that's necessary, the government's going to have to step in and say, well, we're going to have to make some changes. Well, then healthcare costs are going to go up. But right now we're in this limbo where everyone's being squeezed and companies like ours are going, you really need to do at least this minimum subset. And the organization's saying, I've got to stay in business also. So it's a tough battle and, and I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't like it for anyone. All right. So, so when we talk about... Uh, Actually, I've got my hat over here. So I spent uh, I spent six years in the infantry, uh, three years as a, an infantry scout, the 1279 and the National Guard in Tulsa. This is my hat I wore. <laughs> it's old. My kids have probably played with it and wore it pretty much out. Um, so in the uh, in, in, in war, you see people, they wear uniforms and they, they go out and battle and and you know what that looks like. Uh, but the battle that's being fought today is people like me, it's people in shirts like this with collars on them, uh, we're haggard, we're, we're going out to data centers in the middle of the night, we're spending you know, 48 hours trying to recover environments that got ransomware. Um, you just don't see it. You hear about ransomware, you hear about companies getting hit, but what you don't see is the IT professionals behind the scenes that are trying to defend or helping to recover when it happens. And there's, there's thousands and thousands of us out there trying to protect and trying to recover these environments. And it's a lot of work and our enemy is not one that we can attack back all we can do all we can do is defend and if you're familiar with the the um, maginot line or maginot i'm not sure i think it's maginot <laughs> the maginot line and in, in france after world war ii the french built this this huge trench system with these massive guns and they they just knew that that was going to keep germany from ever being a threat to them again well time and technology changes and as time and technology changes a lot of those things that you thought were going to work forever don't work anymore. You know, just having antivirus, just having a firewall, uh, just just you know having very little turnover with employees and people that you like and trust. Some of those things don't work anymore, and you need to implement new technologies and solutions before Germany marches through <laughs> and takes your country. So, um, so that's that's. Let's see. I think I've got one or two more slides here. Oh no, that's it. So that's pretty much what we're dealing with today. Um, Ransomware is a real threat. The, the attackers are very sophisticated. We can build a line of defenses. We got to keep up with what the changing technologies are in those lines of defense. And, and it's, it's, it's a full-time job. It's a lot of work and it's not cheap. Um, it's a lot of doom and gloom. I realize I'm not, I'm not here saying, hey, we've got this magical silver bullet to defend against it. What I'm saying is I understand that everyone has to have a risk calculation. You need to figure out what is your risk. You need to understand what are the the costs and you really need to understand, you know, what if you if your insurance broker says, do you have this? And you're saying no, you need to understand the ramifications of that not just in your premiums, but will they actually pay out if you say no? So there's there's a lot of questions to be answered there. Don't assume that you're secure because you've seen your computer get an update. You need to know that you're secure and have an have a company that will go in, look at all your environment and make sure that that's happening. And that's all I've got.